Tonight on The Henry Rollins Show, we sit down with director John Waters to discuss what's wrong with the movie ratings board and why America needs John's help in the romance department. It's going to be a great show. Stay here. I have never sat in front of a screen with that thing in my hands and played a video game. I once played an asteroids type game that came with a computer I bought in the 90s and decided it was a great way to waste my time. I'm 46 years old and as much as I don't think gaming is a thing only for the young, I'm set in my ways and prefer other methods of passing my time, what little of it I have left. Back in my day, sensitive youths too creatively minded and not genetically blessed for the brutality of sport and the pursuit of females played Dungeons and Dragons, where they were able to wield great power and throw themselves wholeheartedly into a world of fantasy. No one got laid, but no one got hurt either. Years ago, concerned groups made up of parents, religious leaders, and others looking to pick up PC brownie points expressed concern about the nature of the games, the incredible amounts of violent content, and the incredible amounts of time their kids spent playing the games raised what, in my opinion, were valid concerns. These voices were muted when it became clear that the video games were a multi-billion dollar industry. The games and the technology moved forward at an incredible rate as the graphic nature of some of the games made the Milai Massacre look like a tea dance. Something I find interesting is the amount of time soldiers and Marines serving in Iraq spend playing video games. Psychologists recommend video games to soldiers to relieve stress and boost morale. The military made a video game called America's Army to give people a view into the life of a soldier. The game Operation Flashpoint was developed by the military and sold to the public. Soldiers have said that some of the games make the real life situations they deal with more familiar. I think that video gaming is preparation for the compulsory military service that is sure to come at some point. When Uncle Sam wants you, you will be ready. For me, the worst part of gaming is that it is a distraction from real life, which is the greatest game there is. All things in moderation before your thumbs fall off. John Waters is joining us tonight. Starting the 1960s with a camera and a demented dream, John Waters used his native city of Baltimore, a stable of all too willing actors, and his unrivaled vision of depravity to establish himself as one of the most original and independent filmmakers of our time. With acting, art, writing, and music compilations keeping him busy between film projects, John continues to spread his unorthodox aesthetic to the world. John, thanks for coming down. Thank you. That was very, making me look very respectable there. That you are very, very respectable. <laughs> um, you've released, uh, previously released this, this Christmas yeah. album. Uh, now there's this new one, A Date with John Waters. Yeah. Please do tell. Well, I feel like Johnny Mathis, you know. <laughs> Didn't he have one, A Date with Johnny Mathis? I mean, there was a lot of that. So this is just the kind of music I would play if I was inviting you over to my house to seduce you and make you laugh, which... At my age, you have to make them laugh, really. That's a big part of seduction. Liquor and laughing help. So, so basically, I'm trying to have a humorous date with me and, and play music for you that I really have played these songs to people in my house uh, for years. Oh, cool. Let's, let's talk about your film work. Um, is, is there a general aesthetic that runs through your films or, or something that you take to every film that you do? Um, Usually I always satirize a genre of some kind. And then I think of the characters first, and my characters are always the people that lose, but in my movies they always win. Like even in Hairspray, the fat girl gets the guy, where in most movies that never happens. The fat girl's the sidekick. But in my movie, those people are the leads, and they always win and get what they want. And the villains are people that 
judge you and don't know the whole story and uh, are bitter and uh, are jealous. And those are the people that are always humiliated by my characters and, and lose in the end. It's quite simple. My films are very moral in a way and, and politically correct. I know it's, it's wrong to be for political correctness, which I'm not, but I actually think mine are in a weird way. Real political correctness isn't offensive. Phony political correctness is. Um, what is your relationship with the ratings board like? For example, your film, A Dirty Shame. Well, you know, the most frustra frustrating thing about dealing with the Motion Picture Association of America is they're nice and they're liberals. And it's a much scarier censorship to fight. I'm used to ones that say really stupid things to you and hate sex and say stuff like that. Um, the woman that runs the board is very nice. And um, she said, we didn't dislike this movie, but what would you say? That my job is every apparent in America, if they saw this movie, wouldn't you think they would say NC-17? She's probably right, but the thing is, there are kids that should be able to see my movies, especially A Dirty Shame that, that, got, that lost every appeal to get an NC-17. And there was nothing, you never saw sex in it. It was just talking about it. It was, a, it was so juvenile, really adults shouldn't have been allowed in. <laughs> Only people under 17 would think it was funny. So um, you fight them, you go back and you do an appeal and they bring in people. And I don't know if you've seen this documentary, um, this film has not been rated, but it's about the board. And recently at Sundance, they just announced changes. So they, and I think it was very much from this film. Except I'm not so sure the changes are, one of them is that they're going to have a new part of the R rating that says some is really inappropriate for kids under 13. Well, that's making it even stricter, the R rating. And they want, and I, I guess they think that that could make an NC-17 more liberal. It doesn't matter. The NC-17 is a brand that does not work. It's like if somebody had a car out, like an Edsel, they bring it back. This is the Edsel of film ratings. So um, I always thought, well, an NC-17 can't hurt me. What's that going to do with me, uh, with my past? But it did, because even the landmark chain, that, uh, where I always play, had theaters in San Francisco that in their leases of the people that own the buildings their theaters in said they can't play NC-17. Uh, newspapers won't take ads and immediately think it's porn. And if anybody came to jerk off in this movie, they're in real trouble. So I thought it couldn't hurt me, but it did. So that has to change. Now, the rules they've also said you can compare to other movies. You used to be able to say, well, that had a blowjob scene. How come I can't? And that got an R. Well, you can say that now, but does that mean they're going to accept it? Because they just say overall tone. That's the scariest thing they can say to you. That means no cuts. That means you're screwed. And, um, and I was. But if Blockbuster, Walmart, all the stores carried unrated or NC-17 movies, fine. Because that's where all the money is in video and DVD. And they won't do it, though. So since there's no hip video shops left, that's the only place you can get movies. So in other words, there's no place that you can rent an NC-17 movie, a non-porn movie, basically, in, in mid-America anymore. You, you're, you sounds like you bump into this... Every t pretty much every time? Well, no, they were fair the other times. This was the only movie I made about sex. Okay. And it's, to me, never about violence that much. Maybe gore a little bit. But all the gore I had in my movies were so ridiculous, they never gave me any trouble about that. Yeah, I bet they probably have more, more problem with sex than any kind of violence oh, yeah. you're going to throw, yeah. throw down on. Oh, yeah, the violence is okay. Yeah. This is interesting to me. Let's talk about hairspray. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it's now in... In full movie production. It's done. It's a $75 it's, million dollar version. Yeah. yeah, and you didn't direct it. No, 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 because what it is, first of all, I made this movie, and then it was uh, turned into a Broadway musical that did very well. It won the Tony, and it was a reinvention of my movie, and now they've reinvented the musical. And what do you think of it? What you've seen I, of it? I haven't seen the movie yet, but I'm all for it. Are you kidding? A, I have a passive income. Something I never had before in my life. B, I, can lightning strike three times? I hope so. I want it to be a hit. Um, because, as you know, if one thing's a hit, even though I didn't direct it, it makes your next movie, everything gets green a little. Sure. That's how they think out here. It doesn't matter if it makes sense or anything. If something just made money, they let you do it again. I mean, that's the way it works. I just think it's, it's just interesting to me how a guy like you, you know, got every possible bad review back in the day, and that your thing ends up on Broadway and then a movie based on the Broadway play. It's great that anything can happen in America. You know that. Yeah. Did you ever think you were going to have a television show? No. I wouldn't have thought that when I first saw your act. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Things can happen as long as you're willing to reinvent yourself and to keep going. And to last more than 10 years, you always have to reinvent yourself. 
because your original fans stopped going out and stopped buying new things. Right. I did this signing last night here at Amoeba Records. I would say the average age was like 23. It was amazing to me. These are kids weren't even born when I made these movies. So that is the only crossover I really want. The next generation. Sure. Let me close with this. I think as, as the years go by, it becomes more and more important for people to, people in, who are artists or who dare to create to really have a, a strong backbone and stand up for what they're doing. And it seems to me uh, that you've been in that fight for the freedom to create your thing, and, you, and I, I see no real compromise in your work. And uh, it's, it's one of the reasons we were so happy that you came here, nice. because the, the spirit of what you do is what this show's about and what yeah. a, a lot of us... That's what you've done. Well, I, with all your guests, I see who you have on here, every one of them uh, have done that. Well, right? we, we give it our best. Yeah. And so um, that's why I wanted to thank you for coming here to, to be on the show. Well, thank you. I've wanted to be on it for a long time, so oh, thank right you. On. Thank you. Dear Mr. Keefe, I must confess, I have never written to an icon such as yourself. I'm not trying to be funny. You are most certainly aware of your popularity, targeted as it is, mainly for the blue of collar and the red of neck. I can't see NYU hipsters going out of their way to load your music into their iPods. I saw you interviewed on television a few months ago where you discussed the title of your recent album at the time, White Trash with Money. As I recall, you told the host that you overheard a conversation where you and your family were characterized as such. I'm sure these people are aware of their faux pas now, and I'm happy you were able to turn the insult into something positive. I also recall you saying that a single off the album was called Get Drunk and Be Somebody. The title stuck with me, so I looked up the lyrics. In the song, you depict the life of the working man, nothing but a number, a cog in the machine who punches a time clock five days a week and then finds himself through alcoholic salvation. I wonder if you tailor your lyrics to what you think your audience wants to hear or if the lyrics really reflect how you think and feel. Whatever the case may be, the sold-out concerts and sheer tonnage of records sold would testify to the fact that you connect solidly with millions of Americans. Please don't take it the wrong way, but that fact troubles me. Now, I'm sure you're patriotic as all get out. I know you're a USO member, and we all thank you for the time spent with our nation's finest. But don't you think that at some point your music loses its salve in the wound potency by merely pointing out the truth? And does it ever occur to you that perhaps you're making a good living off the fact that a lot of people don't? A little Nero-esque, don't you think? If it were me, I would want to be part of changing their situation rather than suggesting they just do their 40 hours for the man and then go get fucked up and then providing the soundtrack for their beer-soaked self-destruction. Do you ever consider your music defeatist? I'm not into censorship, and I'm not looking for one of those good-time ass-kickings you could no doubt hand me, but still, I wonder. Well, I'm sure you've got better things to do than read this elitist twaddle. I wish you and your family only the best. In the meantime, my hope is that you'll stop convincing blue-collar workers that the best thing they could do for themselves is buy a $40,000 pickup truck on a $30,000 salary. Salam alaikum, Henry. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.